All right, so here is another function we might consider. We're looking now at the third situation here where our limit fails to exist. Um, the situation where a function oscillates. So what do we mean here by oscillates? Well, if you, if you were to try to plot this function, um, and, and plotting it by hand is, is somewhat of a challenge, there is a nice plot in the textbook that you can look at, which gives you a pretty good idea of exactly what's going on here. Uh, alternatively, use some graphing software. Look at GeoGebra, look at Desmos. Right? Um, use even a graphing calculator. Uh, and see what you get. Use something where you can zoom in, right? Take that graph and zoom in, zoom in near zero. See what happens, keep zooming in, keep zooming in. Um, you'll notice that you get some rather interesting behavior uh, because what you, what you find is that you get, you get a function with this really bizarre behavior that it's a sine function, right? So it oscillates up and down between minus one and one. But the oscillations get shorter and shorter the closer you get to zero. Until you almost can't draw them anymore, right? And then they start settling down again. Right. So you get a graph that looks something like this, right? And, and you'll notice if you do plot this on a computer and you zoom in, zoom in, that it, it just, it behaves really badly near zero. It's going all over the place, right? There's no limiting value that you can choose, that you can assign here. Uh, in fact, it's mentioned in the textbook that in any interval around zero, this function um, will attain every single value between minus one and one, right? So in particular, no matter how close you go to zero, Right? No matter how close you choose your x value to zero, no matter how small you make x, you can always find an even smaller x value where f of x is equal to minus one and a smaller still value where f of x is equal to plus one. Right? And, and the reason is, right, so, so let's say you choose um, some a, right? Or yeah, let's say a, which is close to zero, okay? So A is some small number, like 0 0.001, something like that, right? Um, well, what you can do is you could let X equal to, you could do one over some multiple, let's say N, of pi, right? Where we choose N, Uh, big enough oops, that x is less than a, right? Well, let's say in absolute value because we might be one side or the other, right? Um, okay, and you can do this, right? You can, you can choose a sufficiently large n. And you find when you plug it in that, well, f of this x, right, is going to be 1 over 1 over n times pi, which is just, or sorry, sine of 1 over 1 over n times pi, which is just sine of n times pi, right? So it's a multiple of pi. And you get zero, right? Okay, so you can get zero, but you could also, now you could go ahead and you could tack on something like plus pi over two, right? So if you add a pi over two in there, right, then n pi, that's gonna take you to zero, so we're, we're at you know one side or the other of the unit circle. Uh, adding pi over two, so if n is even, and you add pi over two, and you plug this number in, you can end up at one. If n is odd, and you put that pi over two on the bottom, you're gonna end up at minus one, right? And, and, and it doesn't matter what integer value you plug for n, this is always going to be the case. And the bigger n gets, the smaller x gets, right? And, and so this is showing you that you get, 
you know, no matter how close you get to zero, you can always find values that give you minus one and one. And you could also add in, you know, any other value you want here, right? That's between, let's say, zero and, and two pi. And you'll cover all the other y values between minus one and one, right? So it doesn't matter how close you get, you're hitting all those values. So you certainly cannot assign a number here, right? Because you're hitting like every single value between minus one and one. There is no one value that you're approaching. Okay. So you can get some bad behavior like that. Uh, now, if you think that's bad, here's something even worse. This probably goes beyond what you're going to see in your calculus course. Um, some calculus courses, if they're a little bit more advanced, they might look at examples like this. Um, chances are you won't see examples like this until you know, your second or third year if you're taking a, an advanced calculus course or you're taking an analysis course, you might see something like this. Um, here, here's a function which is really badly behaved. And it is nonetheless a function. I could take a function and define it to be equal to 1 if x is an element of the rational numbers, right? So if x is a fraction, integer over integer, um, I'll assign a value of 1. Uh, I'll assign a value of, oh, let's say 0, or maybe we go minus 1, but let's go 0 if x is, is irrational, okay? This, this is a function that we can't even graph, right? And, and to understand why you can't graph it, you have to understand a little bit about the structure of the real number system. Um, one of the basic facts about the real number system is choose any two real numbers, no matter how close together they are, there is always a rational number in between them, right? Um, choose any two rational numbers, no matter how close together they are, and there's always an irrational number between those, right? And so that means that you can't, you know, you can't draw a graph like this because at every point, you know, it's, it's jumping from, from 1 to 0, from 1 to 0, 1 to 0, 1 to 0, right? It's, it's jumping back and forth. It's never, it's never at either value for, for more than a point, right? Because there's no notion of, you know, next real number. As you move, as you increase your x value or decrease your x value, you're, you're jumping between rational and irrational numbers all the time. So you can't even draw a graph, um, right? So, so this, is, this is beyond what you normally encounter in, in a calculus course. Um, and what's interesting with this one, this is a function that does not have a limit anywhere. There is not a single point where this function has a limit, okay? Uh, you can look at other ones that are kind of similar but strange. If you, um, if you, if you replace this one, if you replace that by, let's say, an x, um, well, now this function has a limit at zero, and then the limit will be zero, and the, we, you know, we, actually, once we see the formal definition of a limit, we could probably even prove that. Um, we're not going to in this course, but in principle, we could. Uh, so this would have a limit at zero, but at nowhere else, right? So you can, you can dream up some really strange functions that you, you can't begin to picture, um, but you can still talk about limits, right? Um, so this notion of a limit, it applies very broadly. You can talk about limits and whether they do or do not exist for pretty much any function that you could conceive of, um, of a real variable. 